The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. So I'm very proud and, and happy to be here today to talk about what has become a very, very hot topic of late. And you mentioned the California law and Governor Brown, who signed that into law after a very tortured course in California. How many people know who Brittany Maynard was? Most of you. Brittany Maynard was a very young woman, 29 years old, married, very athletic, who developed brain cancer. And Brittany's course through her brain cancer led her to become a public figure. And her course was that she was dying of cancer and wanted to work with her physician to choose the when and where and how of her death. And she lived in California. So Brittany picked up her belongings, her husband and her family, and moved to Oregon, where she was allowed under Oregon law to work with her physician to have death on her own terms and with her own timing. And she was very public. She made videos that became viral and have been seen. And most of you have probably seen them if you know who Brittany was. And they were on the national news. And she was filmed on the national news, news doing a series of very heroic things prior to her death. And so the articles that we've been reading about California's law said that Brittany swung the needle. And although there was so much opposition and very difficult times getting it through, it had been proposed in California several times and had never gotten enough support. But the public polls now show that 65 to 70 percent of Californians across ethnic lines, across age, and across religions support death with dignity. So one person can make a difference. And in her case, she made a dif dis difference not just in her home state of California, but across the country. So as you go to lobby in New York, I'm hoping you take that story and Brittany's videos with you. And that is what has brought this issue to the forefront. We're going to talk about a host of topics to set the stage for our final conversation on death with dignity because a lot of these topics become conflated, confused, things like do not resuscitate orders, healthcare proxies, living wills, empowering yourself and your decision makers to make healthcare decisions and end of life decisions for you. And now we have death with dignity as the next step to that evolution. And if you're as old as I am, and I've been practicing law here in Albany for 33 years, and early in my career, we had some decisions that came out, one that went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, but before that, just dealing with end-of-life decision on a surrogate decision-making basis for someone who was being kept alive, because we have this line, right? Am I being kept alive by artificial means, and can I withdraw from that treatment? Do I have the rights over my own body to withdraw from treatment and before 1991, the answer was if I had the ability to do it, yes, but if I was unconscious or unable to make my own decisions, the answer was no. And the first case, these are all young women, unfortunately, that bring these cases to light. The first case was Karen Ann Quinlan, who was in an accident in, in a persistent vegetative state. She lived in the state of New Jersey, and her parents went through the court systems in New Jersey to try to get the right to take her off artificial life support. They lost every step of the way. And she lingered in that coma, and the family had to endure that for many, many years. The next case up was the case of Nancy Cruzan. And Nancy Cruzan was another young woman, they're all in their 20s, whose family fought it all the way up to the United States Supreme Court and won. And the Supreme Court, in a landmark decision, 
1991 determined that Nancy Cruzan's family had the right to exercise judgment and remove her from artificial life support. And of course, the most publicized case that many more people remember was the case of Terry Shivo, another young woman in the state of Florida who lapsed into a coma and was kept alive for 15 years on artificial life support, and her autopsy revealed that she had no brain function or activity for those 15 years, but it landed itself in court. 19 judges ruled on Terry Schiavo's case. It went all the way up through the Supreme Court of the state of Florida, but that wasn't enough. And this is how controversial these end-of-life decisions are. Our president at the time flew back from Texas and convened Congress on a Sunday night, seeking to have legislation passed by Congress that would have removed jurisdiction from the Florida state courts to federal courts so they could get a whole nother round of litigation to overturn the Florida Supreme Court decisions. That's how tough these cases are. Fortunately, level heads prevailed Federal judges said, this is not our jurisdiction. Congress didn't pass that law. And Terry Shiva was allowed, under the court's decision of the state of Florida, to be allowed to die at a point in time when she had been kept alive for those 15 years. And there were family members, there are emotions, as often permeate these issues, that bring these things into a very heated controversy. What we're going to talk about today is what is legal now in New York State? What can you do to empower yourself and to empower those people that you want to make decisions on your behalf should any of these situations come up? We're then going to talk about what's proposed in New York and what's on the table for your lobby day and the bills that are currently pending in New York State's legislature. And then we'll look at all of the different angles to this kind of planning. Unfortunately, what we're seeing in our law practice, and we do a lot of elder law, so we deal with Medicare, Medicaid, end of life decision making. We do a lot of litigation in these areas as well. And what we're seeing is decisions being made for people for the wrong reasons. What's the wrong reason to make a health care decision? Money. But we're seeing decisions filter back from care providers and insurance companies. And I have a client that we had applied for Medicaid for. It's a daughter. Her father needed 24-hour care at home. And we were able to get it after a series of hearings. And he was on Medicaid. So he's on Medicaid. And there's an insurance company in between Medicaid now and the end consumer because the state doesn't pay the bills anymore, something called a managed long-term care company does. So we, got, we won the hearing, we got 24-7 care, the daughter gets a call from representatives of this company who were not local, they were from a national office, who said, we've been studying your case and we think that your father should really be moved to hospice. And what does hospice mean? Hospice means that you're withdrawing from treatment. That wasn't her decision, and she didn't abide by it. But what was the reason that the insurance company, who's now paying 24-hour-a-day care, was seeking to take him off of treatment and put him on hospice? Because they only get a fixed fee. It's called capitated payment. The state pays them a flat fee to provide services to people in the community. This is our current Medicaid system. We're deep into it, and it's not good for the consumer. So, of course, she said no. Her father's getting 24-7 care. But I'm afraid that as we go through this aging boom, and as we see the percentage of people who are over 65 in our fastest growing segment of society over age 85, Financial issues are going to come in where our issues and our control are going to be taking aw taken away. So what we're going to talk about today is really empowerment. How can you empower yourself and your family to make decisions and to have the ability to do this through a continuum of care? And if you look at that last number, by 2050, we're talking about 86.7 million people over age 65. And when we think about Social Security, and Medicare, 
and Medicaid, the systems that keep us supported, the stress on those systems is going to amplify tremendously over years. So we have to advocate for ourselves. We have to advocate for our family members throughout this health care system. Death has changed. When Medicare and Medicaid were passed in 1965, the average life expectancy was 68. The average life expectancies, as we're going to see in a moment, are now 88 and 86. So people are living longer. That's not a surprise. People are living into their 80s, into their 90s. My uncle just passed away at 103 and a half. Two women in the United States just died, both this year at age 116. They were the oldest living humans known on record. They both passed away this year, so now the oldest is 114. So people are living well into their 90s and into their 100s. So these issues are going to amplify. So when we look at these numbers, 88.8, 86.6, from an estate planning perspective, we now need to prepare our clients for what we call longevity planning. It isn't planning for death, it's planning for the rest of your life. And how can you make sure that you have the means in place and the decision makers in place that your course is under your control and that you're gonna have the decisions and the finances to support you throughout that continuum. And it talk, we talk about things, although it's not today's topic, like long-term care insurance, ways that you can support yourself should you have a chronic illness, those are all vitally important. We're here today really to focus on other issues. These issues again come up because of celebrities and we hear about them through celebrities like Brittany who became a public figure in her course. All of these names have had issues at the end of their lives. Uh, the one that we have tracked the closest is Casey Kasem whose children wanted to keep him alive. His third wife basically kidnapped him from the hospital took him to the state of Washington, had him at home with no care, and he died three months later. So that's not the way things should go. And when we look at death, we look at these kinds of graphs. This is the old days. This still happens to some people, but far fewer people, because we have the ability to resuscitate. We have the ability to do cardiac surgeries and to do treatments that keep people alive beyond events that used to kill them. So a lot more people survive the events that are depicted on this chart. We get to the next stage. Other people are on this trajectory, and this was my father. He had heart disease. He had had bypass surgery. He had congestive heart failure. We battled that for a period of time, but his true decline happened over a period of about eight weeks. Hospitalizations, and ultimately his death, at a point in time when his heart disease took over. But now we have to look beyond that to what we call dwindling death. And that is just a normal process of aging. And if you're aging to age 100, how do you plan for that? How do you prepare for that? And this one, which is a big part of our practice, and that is advanced illness with periodic crises. This is Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, other diseases that our clients battle. This was my mom. She had Alzheimer's. We had that in our family and lived with it for eight years before she passed. And I can tell you from a family's perspective, as many of you know, if you're a caregiver, how many caregivers in the audience? Matilda Cuomo said it best. She said, either you've been a caregiver, you are a caregiver, or you will be a caregiver. At some point in your life, that will happen, whether it's a spouse, a child, or a parent, it will happen. So when we look at these kinds of deaths, these are permeated with needs for long-term care, treatments, housing changes, living changes, all of those things that you need to prepare for and plan for. Our society has changed. My mother took care of her mother upstairs in our house. My grandmother had something called hardening of the arteries. Anybody old enough to remember that? Yeah, that was the diagnosis for Alzheimer's back when Dr. Levine carried his black bag into the house and saw my grandmother upstairs. Now it's Alzheimer's, but my mom had the same disease. She took care of her mother for eight years. 
nine years. Three meals a day, bathing, dressing, taking care of her upstairs in our home. Society doesn't have that luxury anymore because my mom didn't work. My father was a provider. Now you have two spouses working. You don't have people at home. You have children whose lives are much more ambitious than your life. And you put your chauffeur's cap on when you have young children. And now you're taking care of aging parents. And we call that the sandwich generation. And in some families, it's the club sandwich generation because you have four generations, right? So in dealing with all of these issues, we look at advanced planning. Your decisions matter. How do you control that? How do you take control of the things that may befall you? And how do you prepare? Can't plan, we can't predict any of this. We don't know what date things are gonna happen. People ask me all the time, well, when should I get a will? I take out a piece of paper and a pencil, and I say, okay, tell me what day you're gonna die, and we'll make an appointment for the week before, and we'll get it all done for you. You just don't know, and we can't, when nobody has a crystal ball, but we can plan. We can put solid plans in place that both provide decision makers for us, financing streams for care, and an ability to control our destiny to the extent possible. So maintaining control is a big part of what we do, and we're gonna talk about a number of documents that allow you to do that. And again, this is a gift not only to you, but a gift to your family as well because the more clarity you can provide to them, the more you're willing to make hard choices and think about hard topics and have the talk with your children. What if I die? Here's what's gonna happen, kids. You're gonna take care of the final arrangements. You're gonna be the executor of my will. How many have had that conversation? It just doesn't come up. Oh, God bless you. That's why you're in this organization. You're planners. Most people don't. Most people fear that conversation. So when we have that conversation, we want to look at a number of things and bring up a number of topics. And this is some of the things that we are going to talk about briefly, like the power of attorney, because you can't forget the power of attorney. That's the document where you appoint someone to take care of financial decisions for you in circumstances where you can't handle them for yourself. And if we live to be 100, odds are, at some point in that continuum, we're gonna need somebody to pay our bills, manage our finances, take care of our investments, and do all the things that we're able to do for ourselves. So in New York, we have a power of attorney form. It used to be very, very simple, but as legislation sometimes does, it created more problems than it solved. So we went from a three-page document in our office to a 16-page document for the New York statutory short-form power of attorney. 16 pages now. But it's crucial that you get good counsel on the power of attorney, that you think it through, you appoint the right agents, you give them the right powers. And I'm not gonna talk at length again about this document, that's another seminar, but it's important as a prong, as one of the, the legs in your stool, and we call it the four-pronged or four-legged stool for planning. Financial decision-making, advanced directive, power of attorney is one of those legs. When we go next, we talk about the healthcare piece of that, advanced directives for healthcare. And I am gonna talk at length about these because that's really the precursor to the death with dignity conversation. At what point should I have a do not resuscitate order? At what point do I want means taken away that are keeping me alive? Do I want nutrition, hydration? All of those things should be thought through, should be drafted into your document, and you appoint an agent. We'll talk more about that in a minute. We'll also talk about the MOLST form. And that is a document that is created by New York. Uh, Dr. Patricia Bamba was the pioneer of the MOLST. I have the form with me. We'll talk about what it is and what it does. And up until very recently, almost no one had a MOLST. And there are reasons for that. And what's the reason in healthcare that things happen or don't happen? Money. The most has to be completed by a healthcare professional and has to be signed off on by a physician. Next time you go to your doctor's office and you're having a routine appointment, how many minutes are you gonna spend with that doctor? With the doctor in the room. 15 tops, right? Sometimes five. The most takes about half an hour to prepare and a doctor has to do it. There's no billing code for a most. Medicare doesn't reimburse the physician for spending the time but it's going to. 
they actually have Medicare changes coming in 2016, which will allow a physician to talk to a patient about end of life decision making. So there's progress, and that's good progress. Again, these are not easy issues. There are lobbies on both sides, very conservative lobbies that don't want any discussion. Anybody remember the death panel discussion? <laughs> this was it. In the Affordable Care Act, the provisions that dealt with doctors talking to patients about end of life decisions were called death panels. So the true death panels are the ones controlling the money. That's reality. So now doctors will be able to do this. The most form, we'll talk about it again. I'll show you what it looks like, and we'll talk about what it does and where it fits in. It's for people who have serious illnesses, people who are facing decline that is not going to be the gradual 10-year decline of normal death, but a more advanced, progressive course. The most is the doctor-patient sitting down and going through all of the things that you should be thinking about dealing with end-of-life decision-making. Again, the precursor to death with dignity. So we'll talk about that some more. The next one is one that we do in our office that a lot of people don't. A lot of attorneys haven't adopted this. It's been only in existence in New York for about seven years. It's called a disposition of remains appointment. How many have heard of a disposition of remains appointment? How many people have ever heard of Ted Williams? Anybody ever heard of Ted Williams? Anybody know where Ted Williams is today? He's dead, I'll give you a clue. He's out in Arizona. He's in a vat of liquid nitrogen. In fact, he's in two vats of liquid nitrogen because they split his head from his body and put that in one vat and his body in the other vat. Anybody know what Ted Williams' will said about his final wishes? I want to be cremated and have my ashes sprinkled off the back of my fishing boat in the Gulf of Mexico. He was a big fisherman. There was litigation. There was a trial. His son made a pact with these scientists that do cryogenics in Arizona, that own the laboratory. They pat, literally packed him in ice when he died in Florida, flew him to Arizona, froze him, and he's there now on the dream that someday they can regenerate his body, brain, or some parts of it and bring him back to life. I use that as a dramatic example of why this document's important. What are your end of life wishes? Beyond that, when you're deceased, what do you want done? funeral, cremation, burial, where you want to be buried. Families, and we deal with this, we do estate administration, we do probate work. Families in crisis when a, when a key family member dies are very ill-equipped to make all of those decisions and try to, well, mom wanted this. No, she didn't. She told me she wanted something different. This is a document that allows you to, again, appoint an agent and preordain what happens to you when you die. And we have gotten very creative with these. We have people that are putting in a lot of exotic dispositions of ashes when they get cremated in a variety of very interesting places. Uh, we have people now wanting to do destination funerals and you know, go ha have, their, have a party in, in Jamaica on the beach and have their ashes sprinkled into the ocean. This is people's thoughts. Some people have too much money. They just don't know, they don't know what to do with it. But having this done for your family, again, is a very important step. It's taking control, giving your family direction, putting in place decision makers, and allowing them to act on your behalf. So these are advanced planning documents. Then you get to wills. That's the fourth leg of the stool, or living trusts. Again, we're not here to talk about those today, all things that we do in our practice. But we're going to move on now. And this is the last place you want to be or you want your family to be, and that's guardianship court. We like guardianship. That's because we're lawyers. And what do we get paid to do? Go to court. Guardianship is litigation. It's not simple. You can't simply say, oh, mom's got Alzheimer's. She can't make any decisions. Can I just get a judge to sign a piece of paper? It's a hearing. It's a trial. Mom gets her own attorney appointed. You have a court evaluator. Every party has to be served with process. You have to go to court and have a hearing on the record. Judge has to make findings of fact and render a decision. You then have a guardianship order that has to be complied with year over year by the appointed guardian, and you have to report back to the court on an annual basis and file a full and formal report. Everything we're talking about today is designed to keep your family out of court and out of guardianship court and probate court. 
You don't want to drag your family through that ringer. We do the trials all the time. They're the least favorite things, truly, if I tell the truth, that we do, because families get very heated. There are emotions. There are sibling rivalries that come out, other things that come out. So you never want to be in the guardianship court. So we want to do things like health care proxies. Again, this law came into effect in 1993. We've been drafting them since then. We've had great luck getting the health care proxy enforced. And every time you go to the hospital, they're either going to ask you to fill out a health care proxy or ask you if you have one with you. You don't need to do one every time you go, although it's in your packet, the New York State Department of Health form you get. The last place you want to be filling out your health care proxy is being on the gurney rolled down the hallway to surgery as you're signing like this. That's not when you want to do it. You want to think about this. And the health care proxy does a number of things. Primarily, it appoints an agent to make decisions for you. And a lot of people want to have, well, I have three kids. I want to name all three of my children. That's not what the law provides. And a good reason for that is, what if those children disagree? The health care provider does not the arbiter of that sibling rivalry. So you need to appoint one individual. If we have clients, and many of them want all of their children to participate in the decision, we can write that into the document. I'm appointing my daughter. She's an RN. She's the one dealing with all of these issues. She's my next door neighbor. I want her, but I want her to consult with her two brothers who don't call me enough. But I want, <laughs> I want her to consult with them on any decisions that she makes. But she's got the final say. So you can put all that into a well-drafted document. You're not going to do that in the hallway going down to surgery. You can also put in there your wishes. And this is really where it gets compelling because if you have preferences, if you want artificial life support, you only want it for a period of time, and then you want to be taken off artificial life support if there's no reasonable hope of recovery. This law has a lot of good thought behind it and it's enforceable. We have had cases where medical providers have refused instructions of the healthcare agent, and with a single phone call to the New York State Department of Health, that decision was turned around within 24 hours. So the Department of Health will call for enforcement of this document. We don't face those issues too much anymore. Those were in the early days. Most healthcare providers now want the healthcare proxy. They want someone to make these decisions, and they will abide by them, provided it's within their ethical rules. What wouldn't they do if a health care agent asked for it? They wouldn't allow any assisted suicide. It is not something that a health care agent can do because the individual couldn't do it on their own. And even the California law does not allow surrogates to make those decisions. It has to be the individual themselves. And maybe at some point we'll be able to take the law and advance it another step to allow individuals to put those wishes into the healthcare proxy and allow the healthcare agent to make decisions on your behalf because in many circumstances you may not have the capacity to make that end of life decision in the moment, but you can think about it and make the decision in advance. Can't do that yet, but maybe you can lobby for that and we can get that added to New York's bill so we have surrogate decision making. Again, all of these issues have a number of different moral, ethical, and religious conundrums that underpin them. And there are a lot of strong feelings and emotions on both sides of the issue. So there has been progress, and the healthcare proxy is a great component of that. I mentioned the cases, the Nancy Cruzan case, which gave rise to this. And we've had great success in getting these done. Anatomical gifts you can do in this healthcare proxy. So you can be an organ donor. I have it on my driver's license. I also have it in my healthcare proxy. You put it in as many places as you want to put it. But anatomical gift is a great gift to give. And you can do that now in the healthcare proxy document itself. There is in New York now, finally, we were the next to last state to enact it. There is something called the Family Decision Healthcare Decisions Act. Before that act, family members had no ability to make decisions. With the act, they have a limited ability to make decisions. And it's the legislature telling you how to do it. So in default of a health care proxy, your family would be relying on the state legislature's ideas in terms of health care decision making. 
you can always take control of that and the healthcare proxy would give you the right to choose the one person. Because what if, you're, if you really feel strongly that if I'm in a situation where I'm terminal, there's no hope of recovery, I'm on a ventilator, and I really don't want my, my life prolonged, remember that in the healthcare proxy law in New York, two physicians have to certify in writing in the record that your condition is terminal, no hope of recovery. So you have to have two doctors certifying that before your healthcare agent can even be allowed to make this decision. So there are protections in all these statutes. But what if I want to be taken off the ventilator and the Family Healthcare Decision Act says it's my wife, and my wife doesn't have the gumption to pull the plug, but she's the one under the law that's going to be given that decision-making right. So I would want my son to have that right because he'll unplug me in a heartbeat. <laughs> So I want him in that position. I want him in that role. I have to do that myself. I have to do the healthcare proxy, and then I'm going to take my instructions. I'm going to incorporate them. I'm going to build them into the law so that when, I, when that condition happens and I'm in that coma and it's me being kept alive by the artificial means, my son knows that I don't want nutrition and hydration under those circumstances. I may want nutrition and hydration for 30 days just to see if there's anything that's going to change in my condition. And we draft that in. But if you don't draft that in, there's no instruction and nothing that's going to guide your agent as to what your specific wishes are. So this is an excellent form. Everyone should have a health care proxy. Everyone should have a power of attorney. If you're really thoughtful, you should have a disposition of remains appointment. The dementia provision. The dementia provision is, is one of the bullets here. And there's language. Uh, that you sent over to us for the dementia provision. In New York, if you are determined unable to make health care decisions for any reason, then the health care agent will be allowed to make those decisions for you, including dementia. So that's a very frequent. Mom has Alzheimer's. She can no longer communicate to her health care providers. In New York, the healthcare agent would be allowed to communicate with the provider, get the medical records, and take mom's course and chart it for her. So we have not had an issue here, at least, with dementia. The medical providers want that decision maker if mom can't make her own decisions. So the agent under the healthcare proxy in New York has been given that authority. Yes? No spouse and there's no health care proxy, would it go to a, a sibling or a parent? Yeah, that's, that's the other piece. It goes to your children next. And the question is, if you don't have a spouse under the Family Decisions Act, there's a pecking order. So it goes spouse, children, parents, brothers and sisters. Any questions on the health care proxy? Yes. Um, did I understand you to say that if you have a health care proxy, and you're on, on, on life-saving uh, care, uh, the, that two doctors have to certify taking it off in spite of the fact that you have a health care proxy that, who says take her off? Yes. Uh, and the question was, in New York, there are statutory safeguards that you won't see in the document. But there's a whole body of law in the public health law behind the health care proxy to ensure that people aren't making their own decision to take someone who may recover, who may have the ability to have a cure, who may not be in a terminal condition. I have a lot of life insurance. I don't necessarily want my son <laughs> pulling the plug unless the doctors say that there's no hope of my recovery. He may need the money. So those are the reasons that there are statutory safeguards to ensure that it's under the right circumstances where there is no hope of recovery that your agent can remove artificial life support. If you get to the next level where it isn't a terminal illness, where it isn't an imminent death and no hope of recovery, then it would really fall into the assisted suicide camp. And then you have a whole other set of circumstances and our laws aren't there yet. At some point again, we may get there, but at this point in time, it's really removal of artificial life support and the two doctor certifications are required to ensure that it's a situation where all of those facts are present. No hope of recovery, terminal illness, and that this life support is not going to make a difference 
in the ultimate course of care, it's just going to prolong it. Yes? I'm a little confused around the same issue because mm -hmm. I thought the prior point you made was that at this point the surrogate can't override. The question is, can the surrogate override the physician? Yeah. And the answer is that they're making two different decisions. The decision as to whether you're terminally ill is a medical decision. It's going to be made by the doctor. The decision to remove artificial life support is not made by the doctor. That's made by your agent. So if you will, the, the medical provider has to set the stage for your agent to make that decision. And that was, there were many compromises when the healthcare proxy statutes were passed. Right to life is a very strong movement. And so all of these safeguards were concessions with an ability to ensure that it was only under specific circumstances that life could be terminated. Question? Yes. Am I to understand that the healthcare proxies uh, are not consistent between and among all the states? Yes. The question is, are, they, are healthcare proxies consistent state to state? And the answer is no. Very, little, very few things are. Okay. So if you have a healthcare proxy from New York mm -hmm. and you are in another state and you go to a hospital in that state and they ask you if you have a healthcare proxy and you, show, and you have the New York State one, will they honor that if the state has a different form? Yeah, let me repeat the question. If you live in New York, and you're like many of our clients who go to Florida for the winter. After last winter, we all want to go to Florida for the winter. So while you're in Florida and you have your house down there and you're down there for three, four, five months, and you bring your New York healthcare proxy with you, if you go to a Florida hospital, are they going to honor your, your New York healthcare proxy? And the answer is ultimately yes. The states have full faith and credit. They, your document can be enforced in the state of Florida. However, it's not a document that they're used to seeing. The Florida Advanced Healthcare Directive is very different than the New York Healthcare Proxy. It's about 12 pages. The New York Healthcare Proxy is two or three. And so a medical provider in Florida is going to be used to seeing the Florida document. So for our clients, we actually opened an office in Florida to service this need. So we have an office down in Florida. And when we do an estate plan for clients, and we know they're going to be in Florida four months and in New York eight months, we do two sets of advanced directives. All the same instructions, all the same language, but in the form of both states. So we do a New York healthcare proxy and a Florida advanced directive. We do a New York power of attorney and a Florida power of attorney. Those are really the only two documents. Florida doesn't have the disposition of remains appointment, so you can't do one in Florida. And I can tell you from our office down there, there's litigation all the time. Ted Williams was a Florida litigation. That was a Florida case. And the last place you want to make those instructions to your family is in your will. How many people have sat through a reading of a will? Usually it's only on television. <laughs> it doesn't happen in a lawyer's office. You, when someone dies, you don't run to the lawyer's office, okay, let's read the will. And you know, to my nephew who didn't know the value of a dollar, I leave a dollar. <laughs> that doesn't happen. Usually we get called a week after the funeral. I, we heard that you have mom's will. Yes, we do. Well, mom was just cremated and we sprinkled her. Well, mom wanted to be buried next to her husband in the cemetery. All that's in her will. The will has usually not even seen before all of those steps are taken. And the will isn't valid until it's admitted to probate. So the executor has no authority to act until it's admitted to probate. In New York, the disposition of remains appointment is immediately effective. It's in the record. The kids have it. The husbands and wives have it. And it's enforceable legally. So that's available immediately to make sure that all the wishes are followed after life, not just at the end of life. Question? Can we go back to uh, power of attorney? Uh, this seems, yeah. Um, My family, everybody agrees. My cousin and I agree on everything, and we are executors. So You're the family. Right. Well, <laughs> That's the first family I've heard that everybody yeah, agrees. Yeah, my family do not have, they don't have arguments. They really don't. And everybody agrees on certain. Okay. My question is, what we're coming up with 
and sometimes what happens in Florida. If my aunt had been in New York, it would have been different. But she's in Florida, and apparently her banker chooses to ignore mine and my cousin's power of attorney. Mm. He says, Is it a New York crime? Well, what he says, no, she has, she has a Florida will now. Florida power of attorney? Florida power of attorney and a Florida will. So the question is, can this martinet of a bank president of that branch say, I want to see your aunt in my bank, and then I want the doctor to say that she's incompetent. Yeah. When the aunt goes in and out. Without going too far down that rabbit hole into power. Florida law. The question is, does he have the power to do that? Under Florida law, you're right. It's different. In New York, the statute says that financial institutions must accept the statutory short-form power of attorney. Right. They don't have the same provision in Florida. I would venture if you get good counsel in Florida, they can prevail upon that bank to accept the Florida power of attorney as well. We very often have to make phone calls because the bank, the family will go into a financial institution and the bank will say, well, we need our form. We, you have to have your mother sign our form of the power of attorney. We don't accept that one. And the statute in New York says, well, yes, you do accept that one. So very often the client comes back, we pick up the phone, we call the branch manager, who calls bank counsel, who calls us back, we have a five-minute conversation. Didn't I go to law school with you? Yeah, what about that Giants game last week? <laughs> yep, I'm going to take the power of attorney. Oh, sure, no problem. Well, we're trying to avoid lawyer's fees to preserve my What's <laughs> wrong with lawyer's fees? <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to preserve money. See, see me after the program. I'd be happy to talk to you more, but I want to get back on topic. Okay. Yes, ma'am. If you are in the hospice, do you still need the two doctors to certify? To remove artificial life support, the answer is yes. So if you're being kept alive, well, if it's you in hospice and you're making the decision, the answer is no. Remember, this is a surrogate decision-making document. If you're in hospice and you're unable to, to formulate your intent and communicate, and the doctors have determined that you're not capable of making your own health care decisions because of dementia, coma, whatever it might be, then the health care proxy kicks in, then your agents have authority, and for someone else to pull the plug on you, that's where the safeguard <laughs> kicks in. So when your health care agent is making the decision to terminate life support, yes, you need the two, two physicians. If you're making the decision to forego treatment on your own, and it's life-sustaining treatment, that's your decision. You don't need to get that certification. Sir? What's the difference between a healthcare proxy and a living will? Ah, I knew somebody would ask that question. The question is, what's the difference between a healthcare proxy and a living will? In New York, it's a very important distinction because in New York, we have legislation, we have a statute in the public health law that creates the health care proxy, that puts all the machinery in to enforce the health care proxy, that makes it an enforceable document. A living will is simply a statement of your intent with regard to end of life decision making. It doesn't have the force of law behind it in New York. It doesn't have any enforceability. So what you can do is combine the two, which is what we do in our office. So all the things that you typically see in a living will, I do want ventilation for 30 days. I don't want artificial nutrition hydration. I want antibiotic treatment. I don't want antibiotic treatment. All of that goes in to the language typically found in a living will, but in New York, we don't have that statute. In Florida, they do. They have a living will statute in Florida, but not in New York. So you can do all the same things in your healthcare proxy that you can do in a living will. So we just merged the two documents together and literally what it says is, these are my instructions to my healthcare agent and if my healthcare agent is not available, these are my wishes with regard to end of life decision making. So it really, in New York, if you look at the case law, it's all done by courts and cases. And remember, we never wanna be that case. As a client, you don't wanna be that case that makes it up to the highest court of the Court of Appeals because your family is paying a boatload of legal fees to go through that process, the healthcare proxy is enforceable with a phone call. That's the document that you want to use. 
Some attorneys use both. It's okay. But we like to link them and, and make them enforceable together. Yes? Who should be in possession of the physical health care proxy? Should it be the patient to be? Should it be the... Everyone that may be called upon in those circumstances. That includes the agents. And we always appoint alternates. You can have one, but you can have as many alternates on the document. And we recommend that you take a copy, and we give our clients copies to distribute. Give them to the agents that you appoint, but also give them to your primary care physician. If you are at a hospital where you're having regular treatments, put it on file with the hospital. If you're in hospice, make sure hospice has it. Whoever is going to be providing you with medical care and whoever is going to be making medical decisions should have a copy of your health care proxy. And in New York, a copy is fine. It suffices. You don't have to have an original when you go to the hospital or the doctor. And how long does a hospital keep it on file? And is there an expiration? Ooh, that's a, there's no expiration. And that's, that's the thing. When you go to the hospital, they say, well, we need you to fill out a health care proxy. Well, I already have one. No, no, we need you to fill out a new No, I already have one. You don't have to do a new one. It's good as, as long as you want it to be good, and if you want to revoke it, it's easily revoked. Would the date change if the decision is changed to, to appoint a new person for health care proxy? If you you'd have to re-execute. You'd have to do a new doc. If you want to appoint a new agent, you'd have to do a new document. And then how does the other one get expired? It's voided it's by the terms of the next one. It says that I hereby revoke okay. my prior health care proxy, so you're revoking it in the new document. Sir. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine uh, just yesterday, and he was talking about his father's death. And he said he spent days screaming for a gun. His father. Yeah, his father, screaming for a gun. The, the suffering was apparently horrendous. Now, this was a few years ago, but don't we have drugs that can counteract that? What? what? the hell is going on? Uh, the, the question is, and this is really where the topic of today comes into play, and that is for people who are in those circumstances, who are going to go through weeks or if not months of suffering and have no quality of life, it's just a downward trajectory until they die and they're allowed to die, we have now a number of different things, and we're going to talk about the differences between, and why don't I just go forward to that? I'll come back to this. We have now a big movement for something called palliative care. That's not hospice. They're two different programs. And most hospitals have palliative care physicians on staff. And you'll be offered palliative care. And this goes through a number of the distinctions. This is our current set of laws. We don't have the ability to prescribe the medication that that person wanted, and that is the gun. We don't have the ability to give them those tools or the medication that now California doctors can prescribe that would have allowed him to end that life in his time, on his terms. We are not there yet. That's why you're here supporting legislation to get the right to prescribe that medication. When you talk about palliative care, it's pain medication. And that's usually morphine. And so that person would be given a morphine drip. And at some point, that morphine drip will take away their cognitive ability. Sometimes morphine is given, that, not in doses that does that, but you can take away cognitive ability. You can prescribe morphine for pain. And that's how end of life is treated today extending it with as much compassion as the physician can give, which is really morphine. That's the end-of-life treatment. Now, this is probably 10 or 12 years ago. So, so this has changed. We wouldn't see that happen today. You actually would. Yes, you would. You actually would, yet it hasn't changed that much. So when you look at these distinctions, palliative care can be given virtually at any time when someone has a, a condition that is ultimately going to lead to death, but it doesn't have to be imminent. And palliative care can include treatment. It's really treating the disease and the chronic illness in a way that can take into account comfort care, can take into account pain medication, but it 
does not allow or does not call for the withdrawal from other treatments. So you can be in palliative care and continue to go through chemo. You can continue to take your kidney medications and you can continue to go to dialysis and still get palliative care. Hospice is a six month diagnosis. And hospice comes in and says, okay, you're now diagnosed to have a six month or less life expectancy. Now you're eligible for hospice. But hospice requires that you forego treatment. So it requires that you do not go through chemo, do not go to dialysis. You are in fact ready to die. And so you're not treating the disease. You're getting all of the same comfort care. And that's kind of where the two programs overlap. It's to provide the comfort care, the medications, the treatments that will alleviate the pain from the illness or disease that is imminently gonna cause death. In hospice, you get that pain medication and give up treatment. In palliative care, you get both, or can get both. So there's a whole movement, and unfortunately, they become competitors because you can't have palliative care in hospice. So you either go in one direction or you go in the other direction. I was at a program two weeks ago sponsored by the Guardian Society, and they had physician from Albany Med, who was the palliative care specialist. They had a physician from St. Peter's, and they had the head of hospice. And they were friendly, but you could see that there was some angst because they're fighting for what? The same dollars to get treatment. And Medicare pays for hospice. Medicare will pay for a good part of palliative care as well. But at some point in time, the dollars diverge. And so when you're looking at these, under palliative care, you have health care treatments, and some health care plans will not pay for palliative care. Medicare depends upon the benefits and your treatment plan. And most people are relying on Medicare as their primary insurer in these circumstances. Hospice does get paid for by Medicare. Now, there is, and I talked to the, the director of hospice after this, but it's a problem that I've encountered before, and that is, if we have clients who are at home, they wanna stay at home, most people do, I don't wanna die in an institution with a bunch of tubes coming out of me and all of the rest of it, I wanna be in my own bed with my own family, on my own terms, ideally choosing the time, but now we have hospice coming in and if that person needs other services, what if they need personal care? They need a home health aid. They need activities of daily living. They need assistance on a day-to-day -day basis and they're relying on Medicaid. So they have 12 hours a day of Medicaid home health care and now they wanna go on hospice because they've been given a six month diagnosis. Many places, if you get hospice, you lose Medicaid. They take the Medicaid away. It doesn't always happen. We've been able to advocate and get it in place. But if you're on 24 seven home health care and you wanna have all the services and there are wonderful services available from hospice, you give up your 24 seven home health care. And when we've gone to the legislature, because I lobby a little bit too for the Bar Association, and we've talked about these issues and they say, well, doesn't Medicare provide home health care? Anybody know what Medicare provides even on hospice? How many hours a day or a week you get? Typically it's two hours a day, three days a week. That's what hospice provides in terms of care. So if you can afford to pay 20 to $25 an hour for home health aides to cover the rest of the time, then you can get hospice in. But if you're relying on Medicaid for home health care, it becomes a very difficult situation if that individual needs more home health care. So that's something that we're trying to fix. We being the Bar Association, the elder law section of the state bar, we're, we're working on that issue. It's a travesty. People who are at home and get hospice, have a six month diagnosis, should not be stripped of their Medicaid home health care just to get hospice benefits. But that's the law today. So we have a lot of issues to fight. 
And so let's go back and talk about a couple other things. Talked about the disposition of remains appointment. I want to talk about the MOLST form. And you'll know it's a MOLST form because it's hot pink. So you can find it, literally. Somebody had common sense. They designed the MOLST in pink so you can find the form. And this is the document that you sit down with a healthcare provider and it goes through a range of decisions and choices. And it looks at treatment options and it looks at end of life decisions. When do you want treatment to be withdrawn? And you sign it and your doctor signs it. And this becomes part of your medical record. This is a healthcare document in New York State. Again, not many people have one. Anybody have a MOLST? How'd you get your doctor to do it? She was going to do it. That's great. There aren't many. You can get them in a number of places. I'm going to give a couple of websites later. But in your packet, everybody get a blue packet? If you didn't get a blue packet, Brian, do we have any more? There's one right here. Is that an extra? You want to pass that back? In your packet is this little brochure. And this is the most brochure. And again, Dr. Pat Bamba is the architect, and she's the lead advocate for this. And she's out of Rochester. She works for Excellus. No, there's, I, I didn't give you the most form. I gave you the brochure. Yeah. So if you look, you can get the most at www.compassionandsupport.org. It's on the back flap. So you can get the most right off of that website. You can also get it from the New York State Department of Health. Most hospitals have them on file. Many nursing homes now have them on file. So healthcare providers are getting the idea. What yes. You, you didn't get the pink form? They probably copied it or printed it off the... Uh, off the internet. Still legal, yes. This is just a convenience. The pink isn't a legal requirement. Yes? So if you um, write a most form for yourself and then you get dementia, the healthcare proxy can't override that most, right? If your doctor has signed it and you have signed it and it's part of your permanent medical record, the answer is no. This is your <coughs> medical directive, signed off on by your physician. So it trumps the health care proxy. Yes, ma'am. Don't you have to be pretty sick to get a health you, you, They say that you have to have a serious illness. Yeah. That's who it's designed for. But anyone can do a most. That's when they recommend it. But you, you look like you're okay. You're doing fine. Got your most. It's an advancement because who does healthcare proxies? Do you get that at your doctor's office? Mostly you get it at your lawyer's office or you get it off the Department of Health website. We sit down with our clients and this is a consultation. This is our estate planning consultation. We talk about all the other things on their wills and trusts and Medicaid and long-term care. We talk about all those issues, but we also talk about end of life decision-making, surrogate decision-making, what happens after you die? What happens to your body while you're alive and after you're gone? All of that is part of a consultation process with an attorney. But who's better suited, the doctor or the lawyer, to talk to you about all the intricacies of the medical treatments? The doctor. So I think the most form is something that is an advancement from the healthcare proxy because you are having a one-on-one -on -one dialogue. And if you look at all the things that are considered in the most, it's very detailed and it walks through a lot of specific situations that you may encounter in healthcare. And the one thing that most people don't ever consider in a healthcare proxy is antibiotics. And I had the pleasure and privilege of, when they passed the law in 1993, going to the State Bar Association and having the first healthcare proxy signed. It was one that we drafted by the commissioner of the Department of Health, at the time, Barbara DeBono. So, she signed the healthcare proxy and she read my language that I had drafted from the passage of the healthcare proxy law and she said, well, you're missing something. I'm an internist. The only thing that kills you in many situations at the end of life is infection. And you have not addressed antibiotic treatment in your healthcare proxy. Well, we do now. Fortunately, that happened a long time ago. So we have to have that conversation. But in the most form, antibiotics, 
no antibiotics, antibiotics. It's going to be talked about by the doctor, and he's going to tell you that if you're in the hospital and you have a condition, and we've had some gruesome cases where, where we couldn't withdraw antibiotics with people that, that were in extreme pain and ready to die with no reasonable hope of recovery, unless you specifically address antibiotics in your document, the healthcare provider will provide antibiotics because it isn't seen as life sustaining treatment, it's medical treatment. And there's a distinction in, in the law between the two. So all of this you need to know. We, we know it because we've been talking about it for 22 years since they passed the law, and we've done thousands of these documents. So those are conversations we have. The most gives you the opportunity to have that conversation with your doctor. And again, the good news is that come 2016, they tell us that Medicare is going to put time into the doctor's schedule and a billing code so that they can now talk to you about all of the issues that are contained in the MOLST form. This time, 10 years from now, I'm guessing if I ask the same question, it won't be one enlightened person. It'll be most of you that may have talked to your physician about these things and talked about the MOLST. Is there, is there a statute of limitations? How long the MOLST is good for? It does have to be renewed. Um, How regularly? I, I, good question. It's probably in the brochure. Fifteen minutes? Okay. Ten minutes? All right. We have about ten minutes left. So that's good. I'm, I'm on good timing. So as we're looking at planning, and we have the most, we talked about the disposition of remains appointment. You want to make sure you take care of your assets in addition to all the other health care decisions. So we, we advocate very strongly for people if they want to really plan from all perspectives that they consider using a living trust in place of a will because every will by definition has to go where to probate, to probate court who likes court i do kevin does kevin horner one of our associates at Parrish schaefer and connor stand up kevin he's with me here today he does a lot of probate work love it <laughs> It's where lawyers make money. But a living trust will keep you out of court, keep you out of probate, provide for the organized and orderly disposition of your assets, part of a well-rounded estate plan. So we talked a bit about the Family Health Care Decisions Act. And, and that's something, again, that took New York a long time to get passed. We, there were 48 states that had this. New York was one of two. And I think it was New York and Hawaii that didn't have the law. But I think all 50 states now have it. Simplified method for selection of surrogates to make healthcare decisions. Prioritized list of individuals. And if you want to put your fate in the hands of the legislature, then have at it. Because I don't think anybody really wants to have things written for them in statutes that would override your personal wishes. Take control, do the documents, get it done in that fashion, and then you'll have it. So in addition to that legislation, we also had the New York Palliative Care Information Act of 2011. And this is where you had the shift and the proliferation of palliative care coming into hospitals and other healthcare providers. And it was followed by ensuring patients are fully informed, empowered to make choices, counseling services, and ultimately, they're seeking to get funding for palliative care, to expand the program, to allow people to have palliative care without a six-month diagnosis, which seems to make some sense, because not everybody has a six-month diagnosis. So having the kinds of things that hospice would provide to you if you did have a six-month diagnosis, seems like that comfort care, the pain alleviation, and all those things should be available in an organized and coherent way. And that's what this law was designed to do, to educate people as to all of those treatment options in the palliative care format. And again, this chart gives you a pretty good breakdown on what those choices are and how they play out. So let's talk then about right to die legislation. We know that Governor Brown signed California's law October 5th. 
There are people picketing in California right now, as we speak, seeking to repeal the law, even though it was just enacted. Um, as you know from all the other laws that bring controversy in right to life situations, there are somewhat zealous advocates on the other side of this issue who become fanatical and in some cases violent. And the whole Planned Parenthood debate right now going on in Congress and the willingness to shut down the government to defund Planned Parenthood, which doesn't fund abortions anyway, it's, it's insane. So you have that opposition and you have those forces on the other side of this issue. So in this case, the, the patients have to be physically able to take the medication themselves and mentally able to make the decision to take it. So it isn't a surrogate decision-making effort like I talked about earlier. It's you making the time, taking the time, choosing the time to end your life. And as we're gonna see in just the next slide, the US Supreme Court has weighed in on this question a number of different times. And you have five states, I mentioned Oregon, Washington, the closest one from here that you would go to is across the border, as close as Bennington. You could move to Bennington and have the right to die. Right. So you can be a transient Vermonter. But you have to have a doctor in Vermont who will stay to work with Right. So the Bennington Medical Center is, is where people would go if they want to be in this situation. Brittany had to move, in her case, to Oregon and had to move her family to Oregon in order to qualify under that law. So Vermont, thank you for pointing that out, is a bit more liberal. And in New York, we now have these bills that have been proposed. And I have a, a chart, and Bonnie was kind enough to send that over. I don't know if you distributed it. Is this on your website? Uh, no. Okay, did you send me this? No. no, somebody sent me this. And it has the three bills and what the differentiators are in each bill. I'll leave this out. But there are three different ones, uh, two in the assembly, one in the Senate. And they differ in a variety of respects. So when you're thinking about these issues and if you're going to become an advocate, this organization that you're here today at, at their uh, kind offering of this program, support this organization. I love your new uh, Death with Dignity Albany banner. And get involved because this is not an issue that's gonna solve itself. New York took 20 years longer than most states to enact the Family Decision-Making Act. We just got it five years ago. Most other states had had it for 20 years before that. So our legislature is not quick to act, at least not about these kinds of things. I won't get crass and I won't poke fun at them, but this is not at the top of their agenda. If you've ever been to Lobby Day, on Tuesdays at the state legislature. The buses come in, thousands and thousands of people. You'll get five minutes with a staffer. You may wave to the legislator, but it's not something where these issues are being confronted and dealt with. Some, when they have proposed legislation, will have public hearings. That's where you want to appear. You want to make a statement. You want to get on the record. And so that's how legislation gets made. If you really want to get legislation passed in New York, write a check. And I say that from experience. That's what gets attention, and that's just the way our political system has gone. I could go on for hours about that one. But can I mention one other organization that I think is, uh, is worthwhile? It's called No Labels. And No Labels is, is now very popular in Iowa and New Hampshire because they have put outposts there. It was founded by a number of former politicians and cabinet members and staffers in Washington. It's proliferated throughout the United States. The local official who we've had and spoken with is Chris Gibson, who is a member of No Labels. Um, John Huntsman is the co-chair, who was my political candidate 
four years ago. I think he got 1% of the vote because he was far too reasonable for politics. And what No Labels advocates is not partisanship, but collaboration, cooperation, and good legislation. So they have a number of fundamental reforms, an agenda for America, and they're now getting political candidates to sign on, the presidential candidates. They're putting them on the spot, and a number of them have signed on to No Labels to support it. But it ends things like the filibuster, and it looks at Citizens United, which is the case where the Supreme Court gave corporations the right to free speech in the form of money, the most ludicrous decision I've ever read. So it looks at overturning that and bringing fundamental reforms back. In order for our legislatures to take these kinds of issues on, they have to be freed from the shackles of private money, which is what funds their campaigns today. And unless you have a white knight, someone willing to finance your cause and fund campaigns, and we all read the Times Union, I hope, because they track this stuff pretty well, and the, you know, the, the million dollar case out in Buffalo and the contractors who contribute $100,000 and get unbid public contracts, it goes on every day. That's how government is run today and anybody that goes into government plays that game because there is no other game. So No Labels is looking at that. And to me, the reform of this kind of an issue goes part and parcel with that. Putting government back on a track where it's considering your wishes not the guy in the $300 loafers and $2,000 suit who's putting money in the till going to the fundraiser. That's who gets access. They don't get five minutes with a staffer. They get an hour lunch with the legislator. And that's the difference. So you have to be loud. You have to be squeaky. The people that I love the best when they go to the Capitol are the disability groups that are in wheelchairs because they literally circle the elevator so the legislators can't go on. It's like a wagon train. They literally roll their wheelchairs around the elevators and they block traffic. And they get noticed. And they get attention. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. So be part of an organization. Raise your voice. Be heard. Yes? I was just going to say, those same groups are going to be some of the people who are opposing this law. So Perhaps. Some of them. Um, so that's why we need people to come to the lobby. So these are some resources for you. And you do have the slides in your packet, so you don't have to write all this down. But there are a number of places where you can get really solid information. I mentioned the one earlier with regard to the most form, compassionandsupport.org. And that's where you'll get all the information on the most. Death with Dignity, of course, down at the bottom and community hospice, all great resources, all great sources of information. So next steps, learning about the options, thinking about your values, creating good documents that encompass your beliefs, your values, passing those values on where you can to the next generations by putting them in writing, giving your families the gift of preordaining your wishes into a document that is legally binding and choosing the right people to do those things. We recommend you update these documents every three years or so because circumstances change, people change. You may not think about those changes in terms of these documents. So pull them out every three years, dust them off, take a look at them, make sure they're current. And the most important part about this is have the conversation, have the talk. Sit down with your kids, sit down with your family members, and tell them in, in your own words what it is that you want done or don't want done, how you want it done. And if you have the three kids at the table, I have three kids, and I say, well, I'm choosing my son, Jordan, because here's why. And I didn't choose the two of you, and I don't want you to take offense to that, but I don't think you could make these hard decisions when the time comes. And usually they say, oh, thank God. <laughs> I'm not the one, thank God. But have that conversation, communicate within the families. If we communicated better, none of this at the end of the, the day, when the, when the crisis occurs, when the emotions are high, when people are having thoughts and feelings that are at a fevered pitch, that's not when these decisions should be thought about. Well in advance, while you're capable and able to do so. And meet with a qualified attorney. 
whether it's our firm at Piero Schaefer and Connor, Kevin or myself, or another attorney, don't go to the attorney that did your real estate closing, your divorce, your DWI. <laughs> Those people are not necessarily in this at the depth that you need to be counseled through the process and to do the right documents. Find someone who is doing this day to day and can work with you and your family to make the decisions, to put the documents in place and to make sure they're enforced. And of course, every Saturday morning at 11 o'clock, listen to WGY because there's a radio show on called Life Happens. And that's our show. <laughs> so <laughs> we've been doing Life Happens for about four years and we talk about a whole host of issues, many of the things we talked about here today. We've had guests like Congressman Chris Gibson on to talk about no labels and a variety of other issues, local health care providers, uh, and we cover a gamut of information on the show. So please be a listener. And with that, any other questions? Yes? DNRs. Oh, thank you. Okay. So let me, let me take the DNR question first because I, that is in the continuum of documents. And I can't tell you how many clients that come into our office and say, okay, I want to get a, a healthcare proxy, a living will, and a DNR. Really? Okay, what'd you do this morning? Well, I had breakfast. I played with my grandkids. You know, I went, and tomorrow I'm going to play golf. Okay, so if you had a heart attack today and your heart stopped and you were laying on the floor, and I could take paddles, put them on your chest, and you could get up from that, and next week go back out and hug your grandkids and play golf, would you want me to put the paddles on? Oh, of course. Then you don't want a DNR. Because what a DNR says is if I code, if my heart stops, don't bring me back. Let me go. And most DNRs are in the hospital. You get the big yellow sheet. Line, it's almost like the pink sheet, the big yellow sheet. That's a DNR order that's on your chart. And that tells them if you code, close the door, call the family, don't bring in the crash cart. You're ready to go. If you're not ready to go, don't do a DNR. And so it's a, it's a traumatic event. If you've ever watched CPR, it's a traumatic event. And they will put compression on. And if you're older and you're frail, they may break your ribs. They may injure you. Those are all possibilities. So you have to think it through. But if you think that you can be brought back and go back, and if you could go back to a quality of life that you have today, then you're probably not yet ready for a DNR order. So healthcare proxy is on the other side of that. If I'm on the floor and the crash cart comes in, they put the paddles on and I wake up, but I've been out for five minutes and I don't wake up. I'm breathing, but I'm comatose. And now I'm being kept alive by artificial means. That's where your healthcare proxy and the embedded living will comes in because then if you're not going to get better, then your agents have the ability to take that artificial life support off. Major distinction between being brought back with a DNR and being allowed to die by taking off artificial means after it's determined that you're not going to get better. So a very critical distinction between those two documents. And if you want a DNR, if you are ready, and you're at home, again, most of these are done in institutions, nursing homes and hospitals. If you want a community-based DNR, and you have a piece of paper, even if it's bright pink, and you're on the floor, and somebody calls the EMTs, and they come running through the door with their paddles, are they going to go into your freezer to see if you've hidden the document in there or rifle through your file cabinet? The answer is no. Look or look in your purse. They're going to go right to work. They are going to look in two places. They're trained to look in two places, your wrists and your neck. The Department of Health will issue you a DNR bracelet or pendant. And you can get it right through the Department of Health. You can go on the website. You can order it there. If you want the DNR at home, have the bracelet. And the EMTs will look there before they go to heroic measures to try to bring you back. Yes, ma'am. Um, just to clarify the Alzheimer's thing, if I, if I have Alzheimer's and no longer can feed myself, and somebody else is feeding me, that's apparently not considered artificial uh, feeding? Question is, if, if you have Alzheimer's dementia, <laughs> and you're unable to manually feed yourself. You're not intubated, it's not a feeding tube. Right. You're, you're being fed, spoon-fed. And can I add, Alzheimer's is a terminal disease. 
It is. Correct? And yes. It's incurable, so it meets those two criteria. It does for palliative care, but not for hospice, unless you're in stage Alzheimer's where they've determined that it's a six month diagnosis. But yes, palliative care at the end stages of Alzheimer's is available. Not in the early stages, because you're, you're not at that point yet. Spoon feeding is not artificial, okay. and that's the difference. It, that, that would be considered, I guess, a natural feeding as opposed to intubation. Yes. Other questions? Sir? If I have all the documents done by one firm, mm -hmm. and I'm satisfied with that, for updating, can I stay with the same firm, or I should go to the best one? <laughs> well, clearly, you want to go to the best one, of course. <laughs> the question was, if, if, you, if you've already established a plan with a good lawyer, if they're a qualified elder law firm, and this is what they do, and you're happy with them, by all means, stay with them. If there's reason to think that they're not getting to all the issues that you should be considering, then you may want to get a second opinion. And you can get a second opinion and go back to the original firm. We're happy to do that. We're happy to review documents, sit with people, go through their existing plan, and if we can improve upon it, we'll make those recommendations. And if we can't, then, then there's nothing and no obligation from there. Yes? What do you charge per hour? My hourly rate is 375, okay? But we don't do much on an hourly basis. Most of the planning that we do is on a flat fee basis. So I can give you our basic fee if you wanted to get a will, a power of attorney, a healthcare proxy, the disposition of remains appointment, and have a conversation about your overall and entire estate plan to take into consideration a number of things. I'll go touch on that in a minute. Seven hundred and fifty dollars for for a full estate plan. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Trusts are much more expensive, I hate to say, but they are, because you're front end loading a lot of the work and all the things in that estate plan I just mentioned that we will that Kevin will iron out when he goes to court and probate, because that plan is a probate estate. When you do a trust plan, you're front end loading because you're doing all the work that your family would otherwise do through probate, and you're doing it now. And that includes not only creating a trust, which may go for your lifetime, it may go beyond your lifetime, into your children's lifetimes, you also have to transfer all of your assets into that trust to make it effective. So it's a much more rigorous process now, but it's you doing it because you know all the things that you have, you know what your assets are. And the, the thing that many attorneys do, and if you go, you know, we compete now with all kinds of things, like LegalZoom. Anybody ever heard of LegalZoom? Or Susie Orman, buy my living trust kit, right? <sighs> we'll talk, we, we need to talk. So if you're doing those things, they're not going to ask you the question. Okay, so you have this will, and it's going to say all the things that you want done. But what do you own? What's going to pass through that will? Well, I have an IRA. All right, well, your IRA goes to the designated beneficiaries. It never comes through the will. I have an annuity. Well, your annuity also has designated beneficiaries. What about your bank accounts? Well, I put my daughter on for convenience purposes, but I know she's going to divide it up with the other three children when I die. But it goes automatically to the daughter when you die. They're not going to look at your brokerage account, which is a transfer on death account. And if you have children with special needs, if you have children who need a trust established when you die, and in my instance, I, my children all are getting a trust when I die, not because I don't trust them, but I don't trust their spouses. <laughs> and they're not even married yet. <laughs> but I want to protect them from all those things. And you can do it in your plan. You're not going to get that on LegalZoom. You're not even going to have that conversation where you're going to think about it using those kinds of programs. And you know, Susie's program we'll talk about later. Yes? Briefly explain the difference between power, the power, the, the jobs or responsibilities of the executor and the power of attorney. Okay, and this is going to be our last question. Last question. Last question. We're out of time. The difference in the duties between a power of attorney and the executor. They're very similar functions. It isn't so much what they do as when they do it. The power of attorney you sign today and your power of attorney has authority to act on your behalf while you are alive, but under circumstances where you're unable to manage your own financial affairs. 
When you die, that power of attorney ceases. Your executor is appointed in the will, right? And that will has to go where to be effective? Probate. Probate. So there's a gap in time. When your power of attorney's function ends, you have to then go hire a lawyer, hire Kevin. He's going to prepare a petition. He's going to prepare service of process, waivers of notice, get all the documentation that's necessary, an affidavit from the attesting witnesses to the will, and submit all that to our local surrogate, whatever county you happen to be in. And it's going to go on a pile of petitions for probate sitting on the judge's desk until the judge has a chance to work through it. In Albany County, it's not bad. Judge Pettit does a pretty good job turning these around. We practice, we have an office in Manhattan. In Manhattan right now, it's four to six months for a routine probate petition to be admitted. So families sit and wait. There's no one in that gap. Whereas if you have the living trust, you've already put your assets in, the trustee takes effect immediately. So in a living trust situation, the power of attorney ends and your successor trustee begins immediately. In a will, once the will is admitted to probate, the executor is given a piece of paper called letters testamentary, a certificate from the judge, and then they get to go to the bank, your brokerage, to collect your assets, to do all the things that need to be done, but not until they have that certificate from the court after the probate process. And then your executor is going to collect your assets, marshal them through your estate, pay your bills, make distributions to your beneficiaries, create trusts, all under the court supervision. So the functions are very similar, but one is while you're alive and the other is when you're dead. Okay, I want to thank you all for your time and attention and just...